You were involved in the Murray Defence Committee, uh, what, 76, 77, to stop the state executing Nolan Murray Murray for the killing of a member of the police. There had been a small group of people uh, had resigned from the official Republican movement in, I think it was 1972 or 3. They had moved towards anarchism. Unfortunately, from my point of view, the, the tendency within anarchism that they felt themselves closest to was organised time around the British magazine Black Flag. Very good, very well-meaning people, but they... I suppose it takes some explanation. The, the roots of the, the Black Flag people so on, lay in the Spanish resistance. The people who kept the resistance going after the end of the Spanish Civil War. Initially because they hoped, uh, very naively, that after the Second World War that the Allies would go into Spain and remove Franco because he was a fascist as much as Mussolini. Needless to say that that didn't happen. But the resistance, the guerrilla resistance in Spain kept going until the early 60s and then there were a lot of campaigns for amnesty for the prisoners or release, you know, release after some time and to stop executions which were still happening in Spain. So Black Flag developed um, I suppose the idea that guerrillaism had a role to play throughout Europe and became very sympathetic to almost any left-wing group using arms it would almost appear that the use of arms became more important than the political objective that it was being done for but anyway uh, the Murrays and other people who left the time they got in touch with this and they became part of a network known as the First of May group who operated across Europe it first came to notice in Dublin when the, I think it was the Sunday Independent released a press statement saying that a firebomb attack on the Spanish Cultural Institute, which had just opened, is connected with the Spanish Embassy, uh, that there had been a firebomb attack in retaliation for the execution of a guy called uh, Salvador Antich, who had just been executed in Barcelona, a member of the Spanish resistance. Uh, and executed the most horrible manner at that time Spain was still using the garrote which is a form of slow strangulation the group which went under various names possibly the one that has stuck uh, is the, the New Earth group um, they did a number as guerrilla groups tend to do they did a number of fundraising operations visits to uh, to banks and it was during one of these at the Allied Irish Bank in Colester uh, four people robbed the bank, three went in and one getaway driver in the car as they uh, came out of the bank an off-duty guard in plain clothes he sees these three people with uh, at least one of them with a handgun running out of the bank he gives chase they went into St Anne's Park. He tackled one of the, the raiders, who turned out to be Noel Murray, had him on the ground. Noel's wife, Mary, Mary another one of the, the raiders, went back and started hitting Michael Reynolds, the guard, across the head with the butt of her, her gun to try and get him off. Uh, Marie um, was very recognisable around Dublin at the time on account of the very thick uh, eyeglasses she had her to put it mildly her eyesight wasn't great she lost her her glasses in in the scuffle the gun went off uh, Garda Reynolds died there were raids on about 200 homes in the Dublin area over the, the next few days and nights a number of people were taken into custody this was a time when the government had sanctioned a unit within the, the Gardaí, which was known as the, the Heavy Gang. Their job was to get confessions, 
really no matter what the cost they were allowed to engage in torture and by torture I don't mean just you know people getting a punch or a kick bad and all as that is but I, I mean like literal torture um, they were directed in the main against uh, members of the provisional IRA they were also used against uh, so-called ordinary decent criminals too Of the four people who were arrested and finally uh, were going to were going to be charged in connection with the the robbery and the murder of Garda Reynolds, the man who was accused of being the the getaway driver was badly uh, beaten, very badly beaten, uh, so much so that the the Garda decided not to charge him. They didn't want to produce him in open court. Uh, where it would have been very obvious what he had gone through. Uh, uh, another man who was accused of being the fourth member was beaten incredibly badly, uh, including with a, a hammer. Uh, he spent a lot of time in hospital afterwards and to this day it can be said he, he never fully recovered from that ordeal. So the guards certainly didn't want to produce him in open court either, so he wasn't charged. Noel and Marie Murray were charged and they were charged with capital murder which is the, the murder of a guard, diplomat or prison warder in the course of their duty. And that in the, the 1970s was the only offence in Ireland that carried the death penalty. Capital punishment had been abolished for everything else. They were found guilty uh, by the, uh, the non-jury uh, special criminal court. The use of the non-jury special criminal court essentially meant that it was almost impossible to introduce evidence of the, the torture. The, both the Murrays and their defence team, which included uh, Mary Robinson, later President of Ireland, uh, wanted to use the trial to expose the routine use of torture by the heavy gang as a means of extracting confessions, whether they be real confessions or people just signing a bit of paper to stop the, the terrible uh, treatment they were getting. But in the special court, in the absence of any jury, that was a lot more difficult. The three appointed judges weren't particularly interested in hearing about that. So as I said, they were found guilty of murder. Now you might think, well, that was going to be commuted, wasn't it? Because Ireland hasn't uh, executed anybody since, I think, the last execution had been in the mid-1950s. However, we must also remember at the time, there was a formal state of emergency in the 26 counties, declared by a coalition government of Fine Gael and Labour. Um, the army were on the streets. Like, for instance, if you went into the GPO to post a letter, there were several armed... Uh, soldiers in there. There was uh, a real fear. There was a fear of loyalist bombings in the south. Uh, there were particularly elements of Fine Gael had a fear that the, the provisionals were going to, I don't know, uh, seize Dublin. Uh, <laughs> there was, in, in ruling class circles, there was almost a paranoia about uh, the threat of the struggle in the north overspilling into the 26 counties. And we do believe, from talking to retired politicians, that there were at least four members of the cabinet who, if not all arguing very hard for the death penalty, were certainly prepared to countenance one or two executions. Uh, executions in a case like this would be, as they saw it, would be quite handy for them. The prisoners belong to a tiny little group, practically unknown. Uh, their supporters being able to mobilise huge numbers were a lot less than if it was a couple of Republicans who had been censored. Nevertheless, an actual execution in the eyes of the government would put manners on a lot of the, the provisionals. It would make them afraid to do things. And the members of the cabinet, we believe, that were prepared to countenance the death penalty were Liam Cosgrave, who was the Taoiseach at the time, Paddy Donegan, who was the Minister for Defence, Paddy Cooney, who was Minister for Justice. Uh, those three were members of Fine Gael, and also a member of the Labour Party, uh, Conor Cruz O'Brien. 
Needless to say, uh, people got together and tried to build a campaign against the death penalty and to expose the activities of the heavy gang. It wasn't a very big campaign. I would say the largest demonstration we had in Dublin would have been at the most three or four hundred members. A hundred to hundred and fifty was the much more likely uh, turnout. Now, this is partly because they were relatively unknown people, but the other reason was if a hundred or a hundred and fifty people turned up at a demonstration, well there were another hundred or a hundred and fifty guardi there, uh, people who turned up were likely to have their name and address taken by the guards. Um, they might, even, they might have got a visit at their workplace to try to either put pressure on their employer to maybe say, if you get involved in any more of this stuff, I'll have to let you go, or at least to create that fear. Um, and this isn't an exaggeration. There was a member of Fine Gael, the secretary, I think, of their south... Be just uh, the, the, the area around Leeson Street, Donnybrook. The secretary of the Fine Gael branch there, he, he was an architect. Um, if I could remember his name, Martin, Martin something, anyway. He wrote a letter, I think it was to the old uh, Hibernia magazine, the magazine published by John Mulcahy, who later founded the Phoenix. And, because, and he, he said, like, you know, well, death penalty, it's not really on, on, you know, if we're supposed to be a modern liberal country and. You know, all these accusations of torture, well, they, they, should, they should be looked at. There seems to be an awful lot of them. Now, this was an officer of a local Fine Gael branch. A couple of days later, half a dozen armed members of the special branch visited his architect's practice, allegedly to search it. Now, of course, they didn't expect to find guns or bombs or anything like that. But what it was, was an attempt to scare his customers, his clients away, to have rumours start that there must be something very dodgy about this man. And it was, there was that climate of fear. The Irish Council for Civil Liberties was set up that year. Its very first public meeting was about the death penalty and the need for Ireland to scrap the death penalty. However, the climate of fear, it got to such a ludicrous extent that, at that in the whole two hours of that meeting, the case of Noel and Marie Murray, the only people who had been under sentence to death in 20 years, the only people who were currently under sentence to death, their names weren't even mentioned at that meeting. Clearly, people felt that even doing that was going maybe a little bit too far, that it would draw some sort of retaliation. Now, I'm not saying whether they were right or wrong, but it does give you an indication of the the climate of fear in both the left and liberal circles. At the end of the day, right, um, a, no conviction was of, for capital murder was overturned on the basis that he couldn't have fired the shot anyway. And uh, so he was, uh, he was still like found guilty um, of sort of, you know, essentially being an accessory and so on and being responsible for armed robbery. Marie was still guilty of capital murder, but after a lot of time of campaigning, trying to involve the likes of Amnesty International, uh, international big names came to Dublin to express their support for the anti-death penalty campaign. I remember Jean-Paul Sartre was one of the people who came over. Anyway, at the end of it all, um, the death sentence on Marie was lifted as well. They eventually served 17 years in jail and were then released on licence and of course they remain free people today. Could you give your view on the 1980s hunger strike and how the left responded? Well, the 1980s hunger strike, I suppose, for me, I suppose I should start off by saying that I knew one of the hunger strikers myself. I, I knew Patsy O'Hara, who was the fourth man to die on hunger strike. Now, having said that, and I was involved in the, 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 the H-Block movement. Along with some other people on the left, we were involved, but we were incredibly critical of the direction that the H-Block movement was taking. 
you uh, the dominant group obviously because most the uh, the prisoners were their members and because they were by far the biggest component of the movement was provisional Sinn Féin. Their strategy was to build, I think, what, it's fair, what would be fair to call a pan-nationalist and Catholic alliance. Um, they were looking for support um, from what they used to call the grassroots of Fianna Fáil, from the Catholic Church hierarchy, um, they looking for support from working class people in their eyes it was just one more component but of no particular importance now there were others of us that had absolutely no faith in the grassroots of Fianna Fáil or any other element of Fianna Fáil or the Catholic Church hierarchy and the last thing we wanted to be involved in was a movement that almost tailored its politics so as not to offend these people and drive them away completely. Uh, we also in, I, I should say initially in the early days of the movement the provisionals insisted that people in support of the prisoners should also support the provisional IRA's armed struggle, which clearly some of us were certainly not prepared to. We thought that it was a, a failed strategy. We thought that, uh, and we also thought that the the goal that it was all for was one that wasn't worth shedding in for. At the time, the provisions just were all they wanted really was the unification of Ireland. Most of them at the time, I think, would have been quite happy just to see Fianna Fáil running 32 counties rather than 26. And that had absolutely no attraction for, for people who came from a left tradition. However, we did feel uh, two things. One, if the British government could get away with saying that the struggle in the North wasn't political, that it was purely a matter of criminality. Well then, how is there ever going to be any resolution whatsoever if you don't accept that there's a political problem? Well then, why on earth would you look for a political solution? So we thought it was very important that the political reason for what was happening in the six counties was reaffirmed, was kept up there. We also thought that it was absolutely atrocious what was happening to the prisoners. Their demands were quite reasonable demands and indeed we said they should apply to all prisoners, that every prisoner should be allowed to wear their own clothes, to do or not do prison work as they saw fit, to have reasonable recreation and educational facilities, to be able to get the occasional food parcel from home. Like, why on earth would any civilised person object to any prisoner having that? And the final point for us was that we felt that if the prisoners and the whole movement around them was defeated, and this was a movement that was on the streets, mass demonstration, if it was defeated, that that would even further play into the hands of the hardcore militarists who would essentially be able to say, well, whatever ordinary people do, no matter how many of you are, it doesn't really matter. Leave everything to the few hundred of us running around with guns. It was defeated. It was defeated in the sense that the the five demands of the prisoners weren't conceded, though gradually over successive years a lot of it was. But yeah, obviously the, the, the British government wasn't going to concede everything straight off and say, okay, you but beat us guys. Yeah, <laughs> but it did collapse, the hunger strike collapsed. The hunger strike, the hunger strike yeah. collapsed because after 10 deaths and no sign of the Thatcher government in London backing down, um, increasingly the families of prisoners are saying well I don't want my son dying if, if it's for nothing at all so as prisoners uh, slipped into unconsciousness 
their families were signing them off the hunger strike and asking doctors to go in, revive them, treat them, and then increasingly prisoners themselves said, well, what is the point in carrying on with this? Ireland has had more than its share of martyrs, and if martyrs could set anything free, well, Ireland would be the most free place in the world after a couple of hundred years. But so yes, the hunger strike itself collapsed. However, it should be said that at the end, you know, if, if you take the long view, the British failed in trying to make the argument both in Ireland and internationally that the root cause of the problem in Ireland wasn't political. They failed completely in that. The world, I think, accepted, whether you liked the provisionals or not, but the world accepted that there is a political problem there and it'll have to be addressed politically. And also feel that the people who took to the streets while demoralised in the immediate aftermath of it, and we could analyse all the reasons later, didn't feel completely defeated and demoralised at the end of it. Unfortunately, of course, the greatest benefactors from it all were the, the provisional Sinn Féin election machine. Uh, so we ended up, instead of being asked to trust in a tiny number of self-appointed liberators with guns, we were now being asked to trust in a, an even smaller group of liberators with uh, votes in the ballot box. Uh, either way, the ordinary person was to very much take a secondary position and let somebody else go about the business of doing things on their behalf. Need to say, somebody over whom no matter what they might say, you have no real control and no guarantee that they will honour all the promises that they made in order to get elected. But then, that's, that's politicians, isn't it? You were a founder member of Worker Solidarity Movement. Uh, could you tell me about this? Yeah, Ireland has, well we used to say, Ireland has no anarchist tradition whatsoever. But we were wrong. Uh, in subsequent years we have found there were anarchist groups in both Belfast and Dublin uh, going back to the 1880s. Uh, for instance, the Dublin branch of the Socialist League became uh, the Dublin Anarchists. Uh, organize, organizations of anarchists existed really and very visibly so in the main cities here, up till the years of probably the First World War. Then records disappear. Uh, part of it will be that most relatively small groups are terrible about keeping records of what they've done themselves. Often I think people don't realise the importance of what they've done. Well, well somebody else realises it after they're long dead. So people don't even keep things like minute books and that. And then throughout the, uh, the period of the War of Independence and Civil War, so many state records were destroyed, like in the Custom House and Four Courts and so on. So a lot of police reports as well on you know, minor radical movements in Ireland got destroyed also. Um, we only have frag fragments, really, to talk about in the years from maybe the First World War up to the 1960s. Though those fragments do include people like uh, Captain Jack White, initially Protestant Republican from just outside Ballymena, uh, who became the, the, the first uh, chairman of the Irish Citizen Army and... Uh, the guy who provided their initial training uh, later in the 1930s, he became an anarchist, fought with the anarchist militias in the Spanish Civil War and indeed wrote a, a little booklet uh, called the, the Meaning of Anarchism. If we jump forward to the, the late 1960s, you had the, the Belfast Libertarian Group which included um, a number of people who went on to be active in the early people's democracy, people like uh, like Jackie Crawford, uh, people like uh, John McGuffin, and there were, there were a number of others. In probably the, the late 1970s, we saw an anarchist bookshop established in those Just Books, just up uh, on Wine Tavern Street, there, the old Spitfield Market. 
And similarly in Dublin there was uh, one open called uh, ABC Books in Marlborough Street. Uh, but again, it gives, gives the idea that something was growing because left-wing bookshops run at a loss. Uh, you have to have a core of supporters around you chipping, chipping in uh, a few bob. You had um, anarchist groups at this stage, Dublin, Belfast, Limerick, Cork, uh, Dundalk, and I'm sure Ballymena. And there were ones and twos of people in ours, but I mentioned those because most of them, they're, they can be tracked in that they produced uh, regular publications, like there was a paper Black Star that came out of Ballymena, and it later became the, the Antrim Alternative in Belfast you had Out of Control and an, an anarchist feminist what is well called Gaining Ground. In Dublin you had Resistance. Um, the Dundalk people, I don't think they, they who call themselves the, the Dundalk Libertarian Communist Group, um, I don't think they, they actually produced a publication, but they, they, they were certainly uh, serious in that they went and rented a premises and so on to use as an office. And that. Um, these initial, for that period, the initial groups, with the exception of the dark ones, tended to operate on the basis of almost, well, if you consider yourself an anarchist, you probably are, and the important thing is to get all the anarchists together and show We'll worry about various different stuff, you know, somewhere further down the line. But a few years of this showed that that's, that strategy is not a runner. If you're not pretty united on what you want to do, what you want to achieve, how you want to do it, then it calls into question the very purpose of being in a group with other people because being in a group with other people, the idea is that well, we, can, we can come together, we can maximise our efforts. If people are all going off doing different things, it sort of defeats the purpose of that. And even worse, if people are doing contradictory things, like maybe some people are saying, oh, well, we should be, say, for instance, supporting the provisional IRA campaign in the six counties and other people are saying no it's actually a, a negative thing and we should be calling on them to uh, cease their, their, their military so there's not a lot of point in both those ideas being in the one relatively small group um, how how does a group really function if it's if it's saying two different things? What does it put in its publications? What does it say at its public meeting? Or is it does it just become an endless debating society rather than something that is involved in day to day struggles, trying to offer a lead to other people? And by offer a lead, I mean like not promote some charismatic leader, but rather trying to popularize a set of ideas to. Uh, what anarchists would often call the leadership of ideas as opposed to the leadership of individuals. So out of that, uh, a number of people in Belfast and Dublin set up a, a, a small group called the Anarchist Workers Alliance, which was explicitly for anarchist communism, worked primarily inside the, the trade union movement, and at that time the tenants and residents, so there were a lot more of them then than there are now. Uh, it saw its role, I suppose, as one, popularising the anarchist idea, and two, supporting struggles where people were taking the initiative themselves, where they were doing stuff, organising themselves, rather than relying on, rather than being passive helpmates for somebody else doing things on their behalf. None of it was very clearly worked out at the time. The, the, the little group had been set as a reaction to other things. Looking back, it's all part of a growing up process. It didn't last uh, more than, a, than, I think, three or four years. It produced a number of issues of, of a journal called Anarchist Worker. But then in, the, uh, in 1984, what was to become Ireland's longest uh, living anarchist group was formed. On a much clearer base, again, it was uh, this was the Workers' Solidarity Movement. Um, it was formed on the basis of being for an explicitly working class 
anarchism, for anarchist communism, for working within the mass organisations of the working class rather than trying to set up tiny, pure alternatives. The, uh, the idea was that wherever people are at, well, we need to be there as well with our ideas. We shouldn't surrender any area of struggle to somebody else, allow some other ideas that we think are inadequate or wrong to just go unchallenged. Uh, the Worker Solidarity Movement grew, uh, branches formed uh, Dublin, Cork, Galway, Belfast, yeah. uh, well, then smaller groups, um, Derry, Roscommon, Limerick, um, and I'm sure I'm leaving out uh, a few places, Drada, uh, and, that, and there'll, there'll be a few others. Uh, it's Journal uh, Worker Solidarity at different times came out as like uh, a magazine every few months, at other times as a smaller paper every month. Uh, the Worker Solidarity movement is still there today. There's also the Solidarity Federation in Belfast, this is essentially a branch of the, the British Anarcho Syndicalist Solidarity Federation. They're the people who's, who think that the way that real fundamental change would be achieved is by building a revolutionary trade union. So those would be the two dominant trends within Irish anarchism. Those who say you build uh, an anarchist alternative and then you try to attract people to it and the others who say no, you go to where people are organised and in struggle already and you try to convince them of your ideas. Now having said that, uh, the various anarchists in Ireland, they may have differences on tactics and how to go forward but the differences always tend to be friendly ones because nobody is looking to be the with uh, you know capital letters leadership or vanguard or anything like that anarchists are quite capable of cooperating on matters where they're in agreement and where they're in disagreement uh, they'll go off and put the, the 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 two different ideas into action and then generally being mature and sensible enough to say okay that worked we go with that or that didn't work we have to reassess where we're at Given your political activism over many years, you are currently involved with the Stony Batter and Smithfield People's History Project. Could you tell me about this? A few a couple of years ago, a group of us in Stony Batter who had been involved around the uh, the campaign against the household tax and the property tax, like many things in Ireland, were sat around over a pint one night and sort of the, the topic comes up like it's amazing how little knowledge people have of their own history, that they really only have the, the school book version of history where ordinary people play very much a second fiddle or get written out of history completely where radical history is completely ignored like uh, mentioned things like how few people had ever heard of the Irish Soviets where during the, the War of Independence and the Civil War uh, you had a, a range of factory and creamery occupations, particularly in North Munster, but also places like Cork Harbour, the Drogheda Iron Founders, the Monaghan Asylum, where Pat O'Donnell led the Soviet. Many of these were, they were industrial disputes that achieved momentum of their own. And rather than just putting a picket on outside, workers would often take over the premises and run it themselves in their own interest. Now, albeit relatively briefly. There's a great photograph uh, of the creamery in Brewery, County Limerick. You see, one side of the road, there's fields. Nothing but fields. The other side of the road, there's the creamery, and I think there's a house either side of it, and then fields. So, like, this is not sort of, you know, some big urban metropolis. And painted across the front of the creamery, Brewery Worker Soviet Creamery, we make butter, not profit. <laughs> uh, that that sort of thing was happening in rural Ireland, that there were thousands involved in it. That 10,000 people turned up in 1918 in the Mansion House to celebrate the first anniversary of the Russian Revolution. That the Irish Citizen Army actually continued on long after 1916 as a specific workers' army. That all these things were most people had never heard of them. So again, somebody says, well, somebody should do something about that. And then somebody else says, I guess 
you're somebody, so what do you propose? And we decided, well, we'd, we'd have a go at trying to get a local history group going, which would see its role as uncovering um, the sort of hidden history of ordinary people, and particularly in our own area. And it's been a, a tremendous success. We have monthly public talks. We've dealt with things like the, the Magdalen Homes in the area, because there was one right in the heart of Stony Batter in the convent on Stanhope Street. Uh, so uh, we would have monthly talks, things like this. We'd get in knowledgeable people, we'd have loads of time for questions and answers. And every single one of our talks over the 18, 19 months we've been going has been a great success. We have filled the room they're held in every time. So, like uh, I suppose a lot of people, we got a little bit cockier and this year we decided we'd hold a weekend long local history festival and we just uh, finished that there a few weeks ago and it, it went great. We had uh, three days of talks and events and exhibitions and walking tours. Um, Great in that, I do it, great in that the majority of attendees were people from the immediate area. Uh, great in that it's bringing more people into the group. And we're not the only group like this. There's, there's a great group in, in down the road from us in East Wall doing similar work. And uh, we hope that we'll be able to link up with similar groups in a lot of areas because there is a huge history of working class people's struggles and often achievements that has been hidden away that 99.9% .9 of people have no knowledge of at all. For instance, just, just to, to finish that, the most recent publication of our local history group is on the Irish Citizen Army and it deals in some depth with how the Citizen Army did exist after 1916, because in school we were always told, well, in 1913, Larkin got a few fellas together with hurley sticks and that, you know, to stop the RIC and the, and the Dublin Metropolitan Police at attacking the pickets, and, in, and then in 1916 they got some guns, and then uh, on Easter weekend they merged into what became the IRA. Well, frankly, rubbish. <laughs> the Irish Citizen Army continued on till the 1930s and had its own reasons for operating separately, though during the War of Independence and during the Civil War in cooperation with the IRA, but nevertheless as a separate organisation. So we produced this pamphlet uh, about that, about local people who were involved in the Citizen Army, about the, the, the memories people had of them, and we hope to over coming years to produce a steady stream of publications filling us in on all those gaps that have been left out of our historical knowledge. What is your opinion of the Palestinian struggle and the lack of response to the current crisis from the Western governments? The plight of the Palestinians is, when you look at it, it is one of those things that makes most people say, how can that be allowed happen. How can it continue on for so, so long? It's heartbreaking what the Palestinian people have been through since the end of the, the 1940s. When you think of it, that generation after generation after generation, they could have three or four generations of people who have been born in refugee camps. You're in a refugee camp, your dad was there before him, your granddad before him, and maybe your great granddad. That you're every time that uh, Israel feels a, a pinprick, you get bombed, your your children killed, your schools destroyed, your your water supply, your sewerage, people in Gaza, like like almost like a feudal siege where Israel decides, you know, how much food, how many calories per person will be allowed into Gaza. Um, absolutely shocking, but then we also have to remember, like, under capitalism, it's essentially, it's money that talks. This isn't unique. It's very unfortunate, but it's not unique. Uh, did the Belgians, Belgian imperialism, not do equally horrific things in the Congo? Did the Nazis not do... He could have had far more horrific things to Jews and gypsies in the 1930s. We saw the massacres in, in Rwanda not that long ago. 
Um, we're, we're seeing at the moment the 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 way that the the Turkish government is aiding the the ISIS fanatics in their attack on the 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 Kurdish people in Syria. We've seen the the refusal of the world powers to give any military aid to the, the people defending the Kurdish areas, the only people who have been successfully standing up against the Islamo-fascists of ISIS. So, yeah, we shouldn't be surprised by this. It's terrible to have to say it, that there is still so much heart-rending badness, if you like, in the world. But that is part and parcel of capitalism. And short of getting rid of capitalism, I think the only real aid people will get is when ordinary working class people in their tens and hundreds of thousands around the world do A, put real pressure on their governments to at least force them to do some little bit. And secondly, and probably much more importantly, is organise their own direct aid and assistance for what are our brothers and sisters in another part of the world. Well then, Alan, how do you see the struggle around the national and class question being advanced in the 21st century? We went through quite a few years of very real demoralisation and defeat after defeat after defeat, particularly in the 26 counties. You think of it like, it wasn't just pay cuts and pension levies and services like home helps being reduced and hospital waiting lists for operations getting longer and longer and people having to spend up to 24 hours waiting in the accident and emergency department of the matter or James's. It wasn't just all that stuff. It was the sense of nothing can be done that is engendered, where so many people felt completely beaten down that it was maybe the first generation in Ireland that could look forward to a worse standard of living than its parents had had. But then, these things are temporary by their very nature. Just last weekend, we saw one of the, the biggest demonstrations in many, many years go through Dublin. At least 100,000 people on the anti-water charges demonstration. And I know people, particularly on the left, have an awful tendency to get excited and exaggerate the figures uh, for everything. When I saw the numbers there, I was thinking, yeah, it looks so huge, trying to compare to previous things. I was thinking, but don't get carried away on it. Say, sort of, that's probably 50,000 plus and the media started with that. And then I noticed over the next 24 hours, the media, who generally underplay the numbers at things, started revising their figures upwards. Then it became 70,000. Then it became 80,000. And then when you start seeing the likes of the Irish Times talking of 100,000, then I was pretty happy. Yeah, we actually did have 100,000 people out on the streets saying, not just we don't like water charges, but we're not going to pay them. Uh, this looks like being the biggest movement of civil disobedience that the country perhaps has ever seen. There are no absolute guarantees in life, but starting off with so many people so enthusiastically involved, so angrily involved, I think now we have a very real chance of inflicting a defeat on the government. And one good defeat inflicted through mass people power, I think that will lift people's hearts. That can make people realise that when enough of us get together, then we can do amazing things. The big task for me for the, the left is we've just got to stop being seen as whingers. Most people, when you ask them, what are socialists about? And they'll tell you, well, socialists are against this, that and the other. And we are, we're against all sorts of things that everybody should be against. We're against racism. We're against sexism. We're against people being cruel. We're against people ripping off other people. We're against workers being exploited by capital. We're against people having very little real control over their everyday lives, but that should not be seen as our defining thing. Rather, we should be defined by what we want. 
a task that has been badly neglected over the last 20 or 30 years has been the one of going out and explaining what socialism is. Building a very positive support for very positive ideas. The world today has reached a stage where we have the capacity to feed and clothe every man, woman and child on the planet. And not just that, but to give them a decent life where we can have good entertainment, good education, we can have holidays, we can have a life worth living. The material conditions are there to do that. The reason, of course, it doesn't get done is because a small minority of people run the planet. And like any other small minority, they're going to do it in their own interests. We shouldn't be surprised by that. But the left really needs to get back to deciding what it is it wants and stop being seen as just people who are against particularly particular injustice who are somehow trying to moderate the worst excesses of capitalism. We should rather go back to the motto of James Connolly. Our demands most moderate are, we only want the earth. Thank you very much Alan. There was a couple of things that if you wanted to 